There's some of the remarkable health benefits, but particularly mental health benefits for me of being with a dog. Uh, but while I was upset, he just like refused to leave me alone, which was so comforting. He lay himself across my chest and put his little really? head on my shoulder. And I've actually read that, that dogs will, will sense when you're almost lost in your thoughts and you're kind of spiraling. They'll come mm. up and they'll maybe nudge you or, or just put their paw on you or something like that, just to almost snap you out of that, that train of thought. And I think you build this relationship where you're reading each other. You know? They're there to help us, but we're there to protect them and, oh. and look after them. And I think that's just one of the most incredible bonds that, that you can have. And for us humans to have that bond with another animal, a different species, it's just inspiring. Hi everyone, welcome to Your Pet Nutrition. Our mission with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you and your dog live healthier, happier lives. Today we're jumping into the incredible evidence showing that dogs are actually helping us live longer, healthier lives. Our guest is one of the popular writers and editors for The Guardian, Independent, Glamour and British Vogue, just to name a few. And her unique style of raw but relatable content that helps you understand your dog better contains some of those magical gems you'll ever discover. Her research and expertise have focused around the ways dogs can boost your health and mental well-being. Her well-researched and extremely powerful stories of what dogs do for us can wrapped in a beautiful mix of science and personal insights, allowing her to cut through the clutter and keep our attention on the things that really matter. She's made a name for herself by being open, honest, and unapologetically vulnerable, and it makes readers absolutely love her. Pay close attention because what you're about to discover might be some of the most deep and delightful information you'll ever hear on the science of how dogs change our lives. It's my pleasure to welcome Kate Lever. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you for being here with us. My pleasure. Any excuse to talk about dogs. <laughs> <laughs> my favourite topic. My yeah, favorite me topic. too. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into it. Mm. Um, your book is full of many personal stories about our relationships with dogs and, and how they help our mental well-being and our physical well-being. And it actually stems from your own personal relationship with your dog. I believe you have a lovely Shih Tzu. I do. His name's Bertie, or Bert, or um, Bert. you know, Albert, or Robert, or Herbert, or Bertrand, whatever, whatever <laughs> we're in the mood for. <laughs> so yeah, I, I wrote about him. I'll show you the book. This is what the book looks like, just so that I can show you the back cover because that's where this is Bert. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Beautiful little angel. But yeah, I mean, the, the reason I wrote the book, um, and I guess the reason I'm speaking to you today, is because I. Just like the, some of the remarkable health benefits, but particularly mental health benefits for me mm. of being with a dog. Um, and I live with depression. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder some years ago um, mm. and still sort of occasionally go through depressive episodes. And it's during, and it's also, you know, something I have to manage now every day and probably for the rest of my life. So I got Bert uh, in 2008. And then um, sometime after that, I moved house and found out that the antidepressants I was on weren't available in my new postcode. So there was, you know, week after week of me being um, very morose. And that's when I discovered what a wonderful depression companion <laughs> a doctor can be. Because <laughs> um, Bert, you know, my, my boyfriend had to go to work uh, every day, yeah. but Bert being a, you know, at the time, I think he was a two-year-old uh, Shih Tzu, he had no such professional obligations. So he was able to just lie by my side, you know, yeah. all day, every day. Um, so, so what kind of ways did you notice he was actually helping you? Well, for a start, he just didn't leave me alone. Um, so he's usually, like, he loves a cuddle, but he's not usually like that kind of clingy, needy dog that uh, gets anxious when you leave a room and you, that kind of thing. Um, often he's quite happy to sit on his own and have some special Bert time where he thinks about cats and cheese and stuff. Um, yeah. But while I was upset, he just like refused to leave me alone, which was so comforting. Mm -hmm. And he actually, um, and he only ever does this when I'm upset. He lay himself across my chest and put his little really? head on my shoulder, which I don't know if you know this, but actually once I did a bit of research into it, I found out that um, people actually train therapy dogs and emotional assistance dogs, emotional support dogs to do exactly that because there's something, yeah. um, 
comforting and reassuring. Yeah, Yeah, very comforting and reassuring. And I think there's something, I don't know exactly the science of it, but something about pressure. I mean, it's probably why weighted blankets are so popular. Something about the pressure um, Mm -hmm. on your body makes you feel grounded. Um, Exactly. Yeah, so basically whenever I was horizontal and sad, <laughs> he would come and do that. And um, and yeah, we, I mean, when I'm, you know, happy and stable and cheery, he doesn't tend to do the same. So I really noticed a yeah. shift in his behavior. But also the fact that I had to take him for a walk every day, which meant that yeah. I put on clothes, put on shoes and went outside Just the house. Just get some fresh air, yeah. Yeah, it got some, like, I really believe in tree therapy. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I like, do too, I, just, I love, love trees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and especially like, uh, you know, for me, just the English countryside of that proper rich green and just having yeah. some oxygen in my lungs and also being able to have like teeny tiny manageable social interactions with my neighbors on my street when I walk past, but also like yeah. the really sweet humans whose names I don't know, but whose dog's names I do know at the park. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see them every single day. So you do you do establish a bond with them, I think, as well. Yes. And you have a chat about your dogs and, you know, laugh at them and absolutely together so it's <laughs> oh yeah i mean they're, they're some of my favorite kind of incidental little friendships um yeah. that i've made through through bert um a bit of fresh hair a bit of seeing other human beings um mm-hmm. but also like when you're going through a mental health problem routine can be really comforting mm-hmm. and knowing that at a certain time of day you're going to do a certain activity so yeah. just i mean when you're just sort of you know drifting in this awful low mood um, Mm -hmm. during a depressive episode, um, it can just be so wonderful to have something to anchor your day so that you wake up Mm -hmm. and you say, do you know what? I know I've got to get up and take this dog out for a walk because he needs it. And then later on that day, you can be like, did I achieve anything today? Yes, I walked my dog. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So So I can imagine even if you're, you're not feeling like you want to do it for yourself, you do feel compelled to do it for your pet. So it almost just removes you out of that almost comfort zone of being lost in your thoughts of being quite sad and unhappy it takes you out of that and i've actually read that the dogs will will sense when you're almost lost in your thoughts and you're kind of spiraling they'll come Mm. up and they'll maybe nudge you or or just put their paw on you or something like that just to almost snap you out of that that train of thoughts and and stop you from just spiraling out of control absolutely i think bert does do that um and also i mean for the book um I did, so basically I, I started talking about Bert and the remarkable effect he has on me when I have mental health issues, but then I also interviewed a bunch of other people about the mental and physical health benefits of having a dog. Um, and, yeah. and exactly what you talk about is, is what I spoke about with some of the people um, whose dogs I featured. You know, for instance, um, I spoke to two separate people who have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, one of whom is a veteran, um, and he has really awful flashbacks, um, has difficulty sleeping, for many years had difficulty going about the normal activities of a human existence, um, you know, going outside, buying groceries, seeing his family, all that sort of thing. Um, and his dog started doing exactly that. He got this beautiful dog called Maya, and she, if he is dissociating and having awful flashbacks of his time at war, um, she will either nudge him and if he's really deep in it which you can you know you can get really deep into a dark spot when you're living with ptsd she will like scratch his face to bring him back really yeah because he gets so sort of like wrapped up in it and you know it's very distressing to be in that state and she just like goes at him until (laughs) until he snaps back (laughs) Um, just forces and, him out of it yeah yeah exactly and now uh, it's i just found that so beautiful and she actually uh i mean i don't know how light you want to keep this this video but she actually um stopped him from killing himself twice um wow. by physically putting herself between him and what he was going to use um to kill himself Gosh. so just like remarkable creatures yeah. so they just um, know they know exactly what's going on and they can really read your emotions i think and there's another interesting story in your book about a young boy. It's quite inspiring. A young boy with autism and his pug. Mm. And I really want to hear more about that story. Oh, my God. Yeah. OK, so Corey is the young man. He would probably be, I think, 11 years old now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he lives with autism. 
um, which means that he found going to school really difficult. Um, he had a sort of sort of a lot of uh, trouble regulating his emotions, particularly when he felt overwhelmed. Um, he had um, sort of perceptive sensitivity, so he was very sensitive to things like changes in light and loud noises. Um, yep. And loud noises can be just, you know, the, the sound of people talking outside or even in a classroom. All of those sorts of things used to trigger him. Um, and he, you know, when he was about, I think, seven, was in a really rough patch and he just, um, you know, I spoke to his darling mum, Jill, um, who, you know, has gone through a really, really rough time because her sweet little boy was talking about not wanting to be here anymore and all those sorts of things Gosh. that are just devastating to hear. Yeah. And But, you know, the funny thing, the, the, uh, the thing about um, some autistic people is they often um, develop a real focus, almost an obsessive area of interest, a topic of interest. Mm -hmm. Um, which they become expert in, whether it's, you know, the maps of London or the life of a penguin. Um, yeah. But this kid, Corey, his absolute, like, specialty topic, if he was going to go on a quiz show, is punks. And he has just, <laughs> just always punks. loved no other, punks. No other breed. <laughs> no, other, he, no he doesn't punks. care for any other breed. <laughs> just has honed in on pugs and he has, like... Pug bed sheets, pug money box, wow. pug everything. Just like <laughs> lives the the best, you know, living his best pug life. Um, yeah. And so basically, one year when he had had a really rough time, um, it was his birthday, and his mum was unwell, basically from the stress of looking after him. And mm -hmm. she went on Facebook and found one of those adorably niche Facebook groups that was like I love pugs or something like that, <laughs> and and said to this glorious pug community you know it's my son's birthday this is what he's been through i don't have the energy or the resources to throw him a birthday party right now can you send photos of your pugs <laughs> and she was just inundated with all these beautiful messages from pug people um wow. who asked for you know their address so that they could send pug toys and pug mugs <laughs> and you know which obviously he loved um yep. and then they invited him to a pug event where he went all day and socialized with pugs. And it, Corey's mom just said it was like watching a different child because usually he's withdrawn, shy, sometimes angry, distressed in a social situation. But around pugs and their people, he was like, hey, nice to see you. Like, <laughs> looking good. So those problems was, just kind of disappeared. Yeah, like he yeah. just, you know, it calmed him and it brought him out of himself and it made him feel safe. Um, so obviously she said to her husband, I think we're going to need to get a pug. I think pugs are such nice characters as well and they're, they're proper family dogs, I think, and they get on well with kids. So I think a pug would be the perfect match for, for this kind of situation. Mm. But um, I think what I find inspiring about your book is that you have all these personal stories and, and relatable stories, but you back it up with actual research, which you've done yourself. Um, so how did you go about that? Actually saying, right, I need to research these ideas and, and where did you find them? And did you speak to scientists or experts? Great question. Um, I mean, I kind of wrote this book. I mean, a lot of different authors have different approaches, but I like the approach where you write the book that you would like to read. And mm -hmm. I love touching personal stories. But whenever I read one, I also want to know, you know, whether that's a common thing and whether you know like when I'm thinking yeah. about how Bert helps me with depression I'm thinking like you know what is the dog psychology behind that and how can I back up the things that I feel emotionally with yeah. special scientific evidence <laughs> the facts you want the facts yeah exactly and I think I think that just comes maybe from being a journalist um yeah. you know I'm not a scientist myself but as I say I'm a journalist so I'm you know, skilled at asking people who are better qualified than me to explain things. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I translate it into normal people speak. Um, <laughs> so basically all I did was, um, well, first of all, I found the dog stories, which were 10 mm -hmm. stories of incredible dogs. And I wanted to get a lovely sort of range of problems that they helped people with. So there's a teenager who trained her border collie to, to smell when she has high or low blood pressure. Um, mm -hmm. She lives with diabetes, beautiful story. So then I looked into the science of how dogs can detect 
things like that, but also things like malaria. You know, I think they have like a a 95 or 96 percent accuracy rate in detecting malaria, which is just remarkable. Wow. That's and also, incredible. And also, like at the moment, a dog is a more reliable diagnostic tool for uh, prostate cancer, I think it is, than anything really? else we have in hospitals. So. Gosh. That kind of research was perfect for me because I was able to tell the human story and then say, like, by the way, here's more proof that dogs yeah. are the best creatures in the world. Exactly. Um, and I think there is a lot more research going on into exactly how they, they can read us and whether it's purely scent and any hormones that we release, like cortisol or serotonin. Or I think from my own anecdotal research, I think it's probably a mixture of that and then the way that we carry ourselves when we're feeling a certain way. So if we're feeling unwell or maybe anxious or depressed, our whole body demeanor changes the way mm. we carry ourselves, the way we speak, the tone of our voice, um, our interaction with other people. And I think dogs are so aware of that and they can pick up on the slightest changes, even the tone of your voice. Yeah. And I think that coupled with maybe a rise in cortisol, with which is common with anxiety, or maybe even sense your heartbeat, anything like that. I think that all fits into this puzzle and it allows them to, to read exactly how we are. And then they act on that. And that's when, you know, it comes into the, the storyline of your book where these dogs sense these problems and then are able to lift us up and, and out of those depressive or anxious periods. So it's it's such an interesting area of research. And I really, um, I'm always keeping an eye out for, for the latest papers that come out and. Uh, something to, to definitely keep an eye on for myself. Yeah, well, there's, that, there's some, I mean, this is what I discovered when I was putting together the proposal for this book to sell to publishers. And um, there's actually quite a lovely amount of really mm. nice dog research out there. Um, you know, I had a couple of people say to me, like, really? Like, people are spending money on finding out whether dogs can tell when we're sad? <laughs> I was like, yes, it's very important. <laughs> um, very important. You know, very give, important. give scientists all the money um, to, to discover all sorts of things about the creatures that we live with and, and you know, the human experience. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think, as you say, I think it's a combination of having an extraordinarily strong sense of smell, which helps them pick up on things that perhaps we don't smell on each other, like, mm -hmm. you know, pheromones or, uh, as you say, cortisol, yeah. that, that nasty stress hormone, um, yeah. <laughs> which I am just like full of so often yeah. um but us vets have a high cortisol level as well trust me <laughs> <laughs> some days at work oh, oh yeah oh my work. god i bet i cannot imagine <laughs> but yeah i mean and i think it's also like i did some really probably my favorite bit of research that i did was um talking to some academics and um reading a study about whether dogs have the capacity to feel empathy and to act on it um, and they basically did this, you know, very complicated, but basically the, the idea of the experiment was to, um, you know, put a series of dogs in a room and play them different noises, sort of neutral ones like a, you know, a babbling brook and a rustling tree, but also the sound of, you know, a woman laughing, a man crying, mm -hmm. um, a dog making very clearly positive or negative sounds, you know, whimpering or making excited sounds and see what their reaction was and table all of that and work out whether they found basically the sound of human or animal distress infectious for them, which is sort of, you know, the idea of the way empathy operates. Um, and essentially they ruled that yes, dogs can feel empathy, but the extraordinary thing is not just for their own species. So they found that, you know, a lot of, um, other species like types of monkeys and stuff who are close, more closely related to us, um, than dogs, they can show empathy for their own species, but they're like, sometimes not that keen on <laughs> empathizing with us. Whereas dogs yep. seem to react equally to a distressed human and a distressed dog. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. And once again, kind of just backs me up on something that was my instinct, which is that I've, I felt that, you know, my dog was feeling empathy and, and even I would go as far as to say compassion for me and perhaps sympathy. And I think that's based on a lot of what you said about them being able to pick up that something's not quite right, whether we're sort of, you know, 
like you know waddling around the house um in a in Definitely. a morose state or you know as you yeah. said i mean I they have, can read us like a book yeah they can read us like absolutely a book. Yeah. i mean i have very very chatty conversations cheery chatty conversations with my dog all the time um <laughs> you know and i there's another study that said people who speak to their dogs have a higher iq so i'm very happy with you well know, there you go i'm shameless there about telling go. people i have very long involved <laughs> conversations with my dog um but yeah he would of course he would notice if i was more quiet and more sedentary and just you know i, I mean i yeah, like, definitely yeah that, they spend if you think of it you know they spend their whole lives from a puppy to, to the end of their life with us so they learn to read us and they grow alongside us. So they're going to learn, you know, the differences between in a family, how the son might behave or what might upset him and then what might upset the mother or the father. Because because we're all so different in our emotions. But I think dogs can even read between those those emotions and between different people, Definitely. which is inspiring. I mean, we hear these stories. My clients come in and they tell stories about how the dogs and, and other pets have also helped them through hard times and through loss and love. And it just, it's so amazing to, to see the way that animals can bring that joy to, to clients. Oh, so lovely. And it is joy. It is joy. Like I find Bert is so funny. He makes me laugh, not always intentionally, every day, you know? <laughs> but I'm very pleased to have the backing of a vet to tell me that dogs Definitely. are, you know, yeah. this perceptive. Yeah, but I think your book couldn't have come at a more important time as well, because I know that some of the stories are, are quite, um, you know, profound and, you know, have people with really traumatic experiences in their life and how dogs help them. But but we're all kind of going through a traumatic experience right now with the, the pandemic. So I think having a dog in your life couldn't have come at a better time and, and having this book to support that. Um, that's come with its own problems as well during the pandemic as, as vets. Um, but you have really seen how, how dogs can, can help people get through this. Um, hopefully the end is near, but... but yes, um, well, let's hope are... so. I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, Bert has provided such solace and comfort and company throughout this pandemic. And I think, you know, we're not human if we're not feeling anxious, at least some of the time, if not, you know, having a sort of constant bubbling of anxiety underneath everything else we do at the moment. Um, and I think people who have dogs, um, don't even need to be told um, but also love to hear other people talk about how good dogs are so I hope you're right yeah. I hope people will like the book for that reason but as you say you know yeah. I, there was a very stupid article that went viral over the last few days um, the, a man who wrote about getting a puppy and then realizing he had to care for the puppy and then returning the puppy and like obviously it is the right thing to do if you feel overwhelmed and you can't care for a dog obviously take it to a vet or a shelter and make sure they can live their safest lives exactly you know that's great yeah i never want to shame someone for returning a dog to a safe place um but like he clearly did not think about the obligations of taking care of a dog and they're living creatures who need us i mean that's why it's such a beautiful relationship because you know bert helps me with my mental health but i'm constantly like googling how can you tell if your dog's happy um <laughs> and also like it's, it's a it's a synergistic relationship yeah, you know you, you're there for each other feed them and make sure they're nourished and made sure they're well looked after and make sure they're mm -hmm. exercised the right amount for their breed and size and yeah. you know and have the best nutrition and which have is where the best we come nutrition. in exactly. your pet nutrition <laughs> that's what we're here for exactly. um, but it is it's a huge commitment and i think it's very obvious that people are aware of the benefits of dogs, but they, I think in this mad rush to, to buy a dog or adopt a dog during the pandemic, they, they almost don't do any research whatsoever and then just skip to the point of having a puppy and then think, oh, actually, I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Or I didn't realize that the dog's, the puppy's gonna wake me up three times in the night, every night for the next several months. Yeah or they're gonna get parasites or they need monthly parasite prevention and, and vaccinations. And we get these clients coming in and and I'm just kind of almost shocked at like, why didn't you think of this before, before actually getting a dog? <laughs> um, I mean, it is wonderful. It's so wonderful to see so many puppies, but I just really want everyone to do their research and, and make sure that they are fully equipped to, to have a dog in their lives. Because it, it is hard work. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a commitment. It's a, a living, a living being. I mean, I know, you know, some people on the internet probably get angry if I liken 
having a dog to having a human baby, but it's not drastically. I mean, yes, okay, no. probably I don't have a human baby, but having a dog is, you know, it's still it's this huge responsibility <laughs> for the happiness and well-being and health and nutrition and happiness of you know, a yeah. living creature that you care deeply and, about. And like children, like babies, they can't talk. So you have to be there to read read them. So just like we're talking about dogs reading us, we have to read them and, and sense when something is maybe not right. And it's never, it's not always that obvious. Yeah. Um, and that's where the vets come in. So if you do ever notice yes. anything that might be off with your dog, go to the vet. Um, but yeah, it is, you, and I think you build this relationship where you're reading each other, you know, they're there to help us, but we're there to protect them and, and look after them. And I think that's just one of the most incredible bonds that, that you can have. And for us humans to have that bond with another animal of different species, it's just inspiring. So I can't wait to have read through all your stories and your book and, and all the research because uh, that really excites me. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just an incredible, incredible book. And I think, yeah, well done. You've done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good topic to choose that my first book was about friendship and my second book was about dogs. So I think maybe for the rest of my career, perhaps I will just write about lovely things. <laughs> I, mean, I think you know. I think that's what the world needs right now. Just <laughs> books of lovely things just to get us through everything. So, exactly, exactly. Well, so thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So, pet parents, you're going to want to dive into the depths of wisdom Kate has uncovered in her book. The stories and science is astounding. You've seen a glimpse into the raw and real stories in a new book, The Good Dog, and it's packed with exciting and fun stories of, mm -hmm. of our relationship with dogs. And she's been kind enough to give us five copies of this fascinating book to give away. If you'd like a chance to win your free copy, reply back and email into me at michael at yourpetnutrition.com with a paragraph on what your dog has done for you. We'll be randomly picking the winners at the end of this week. And if you haven't already, be sure to like, share and subscribe the video below. For your pet's health and happiness, this is Dr. Michael Lazarus.